Good morning, church. It is Resurrection Sunday. Jesus has risen. Today, two churches, Hope and Katong Presbyterian Church, we will be worshipping together online. And due to a new advisory from our government, our worship team is unable to do a recording in church. So there will be a new way of doing online service from today onwards. And we'll be transporting you from home to home where our video segments are recorded. Therefore, by God's grace, worship service shall continue. So let us begin with the words of the psalmist in Psalm 46. He said this, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its water roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, come and see the works of the Lord the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shoes with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Good morning, church. Happy Easter Sunday. Even as we come before the Lord, um, let us give thanks and realize that our God is above all authorities. Shall we rise together and sing this song?
Let's pray. Lord, we are so blessed and so thankful to be in your presence, to have your spirit in us. Because of what you have done, Lord, your death and your resurrection, and now you are seated on the throne for forever, for all eternity. Lord, we have this hope of a glorious eternity with you. Because of who you are, we can gather in different places, but still as one church, one body. And we thank you, Lord. Yet we often take our eyes off you. We look at our struggles, our problems, our pains, and we forget who you are. We forget that you are sovereign, that you are greater. Forgive us, Lord, for not doing what we should and for doing what we should not. Let us all take a moment now just to come before the Lord in humble repentance. Lord, we thank you that in your Son, Jesus Christ, we are not left alone to die for our sins or to wallow in our guilt and shame. But you have provided a way for us to be in communion with you. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. Help us to honor you each and every day of our lives for your glory and your name. In Jesus' name we pray.
Here we are as your people, as your church, to declare that we are here to worship you. May you reign on high as King and Lord. In this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning and a warm welcome to members and regulars of HPC and KPC and any other friends who may have joined us this Easter Sunday morning. May you be blessed through the service as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have only one announcement this morning, but an important one to all members of KPC about the postponement of the annual congregational meeting. We are in extraordinary times and societies may delay their ACM or conduct them online. KPC will postpone its ACM from 26th of April to the 24th of May. Any member who has any objections about this arrangement must inform the session by today, 12th of April. In the meantime, the session will find the best way to conduct the ACM online and details will be sent out to members soon. Next, the offering will be collected. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Indeed, as we ponder the generous giving of our Lord Jesus Christ, may we be moved to also give generously for the sake of the work of His Kingdom here on earth. Amen.
us give thanks for our offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you not only with our lips, but with our whole lives, turning our duties, our sorrow, our joy into a living sacrifice to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, prayer for the people. We will be praying for the unbelievers and believers. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed to in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we celebrate your love that came down into a manger. Love came down from heaven. Love lived among us. Love expressed compassion. Love provided healing. Love reveals truth. Love gave wisdom. Love suffered and died for our sins. Love was raised on the third day. And love reigns in our hearts. And Lord, we praise you and thank you all with a grateful heart for love. Lord, have mercy upon the unbelievers that they may come to know and appreciate your saving grace through your Son, Jesus Christ. Remove their pride and touch their hearts when Christ's name is proclaimed to them. Grant them a repentant heart to receive your forgiveness of sins. Lord, we want to pray for the believers that you may grant us the bonus to proclaim your name, to live a life that will mirror Christ's likeness, led by your Holy Spirit. May you grant us your peace, your strength, and your wisdom as we wait upon Christ's return. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is taken from John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld 
This is the word of God. Even in the midst of uh, this crisis, this COVID crisis, we know that people have hope in their homes, in their finances. But during this Easter season, we remember that our hope is not in things of this world, but in our living hope. It says in 1 Peter 1, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is to be revealed in the last time. Let's rise as we sing this song together of Jesus Christ, our living hope. Claim on. 
Jesus Christ, our living hope. Please be seated. It is my joy this morning to introduce Dr. Mark Chan. He is the Ernest Lau Professor of Systematic Theology at the Trinity Theological College. He teaches courses in hermeneutics, homiletics, and other theological studies, as well as also supervising the postgraduate research. An alumnus of uh, TTC, Mark did his postgraduate studies at Fuller Theological Seminary, USA, and completed his PhD in Philosophical Hermeneutics and Christology at the University of Nottingham, UK. He worships with his wife at Covenant Community Methodist Church. Dr. Mark Chan, please. Well, good morning. May I, on the behalf of Trinity Theological College, greet you warmly in the name of our risen Lord. Wherever we are gathered around the island and around the world, we are gathered in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we rejoice with believers all around the world in the good news that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is risen today. The passage that was read earlier from John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23 May I encourage you to keep that passage open as we commit this time to God in prayer. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On March the 5th, 2013, the people of Venezuela mourned the passing of their beloved president, Hugo Chavez. The political establishment of Venezuela wanted to embalm his body and place it in a glass case for public display. Unfortunately, not enough was done immediately after his death to prepare the body for permanent preservation. And as a result, they had to abandon the plan. If they had succeeded, Hugo Chavez would have been the latest in a line of leaders whose remains had been embalmed and put on display. Think about Russia's Lenin, or Georgia's Stalin, or China's Mao Zedong, or Vietnam's Ho Chi Minh, or North Korea's founding leader, Kim Yu sung Now, the fact that all of them were communists, and atheists, all of whom had no hope beyond the grave, may have prompted their followers to preserve their bodies. Perhaps they thought to themselves, if we do that, we could at least invest some semblance of immortality upon our beloved leaders. At least this way, it would not be said of them out of sight, out of mind. But when we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the death of Jesus, there was no need for such pretensions of immortality. Even if the early disciples had wanted to embalm the body of Jesus and display it in a glass case in Jerusalem for all to see, they couldn't have done it, for there simply was no body to display. What we have in state is an empty tomb, and that's the great news of Easter. That's the news we all celebrate as brothers and sisters, Christians around the world, that the crucified Jesus was raised back to life on the third day. John 20 records for us one of our Lord's appearances to his disciples after the resurrection. We read in the text that the disciples were frightened. They were huddling behind locked doors and Jesus came and stood among them, the text says, and he said to them, peace be with you. Now, ordinarily, the words, peace be with you, wouldn't be that unusual. It's like our, hello, how are you? It's a typical greeting of the day, but not this time. For these words were spoken by someone whom they knew to be already dead. And as if this were not astonishing enough, Jesus came into their midst when all the doors were locked. They must have been completely astounded by this appearance and these words, from one who had already died. 
How is that possible? How is that possible? My friends, no locked doors could keep the risen Jesus from his own. And that's the message of Easter. It's about God breaking through the locked doors of our fears, of our anxieties, to give us his peace. Despite our disappointment, despite our failures, despite our sense of hopelessness, Christ stands in our midst with his offer of peace. And I can think of no more appropriate time as the time that we are in at the moment, when the world is in anxiety and fear, that the message of Easter is about a risen Christ. No locked doors can keep him from his own. What Jesus said to his disciples, peace be with you, simple words. Yet these words had life-changing, profound impact. Now, when the disciples heard these words, we read in, verse, in, in our passage that they were overjoyed. Perhaps in their moment of unbelievable joy, it did not occur to them that Jesus had already promised them peace earlier on. If we read in John chapter 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. John chapter 16, verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus had promised them peace, and now in his resurrected appearance, he reiterated that offer of peace. Peace be with you. And that peace of Jesus is inextricably tied to his life and ministry. In the context of our Lord's teaching and in the New Testament uh, as a whole, peace or shalom denotes the quality of life that God's people will enjoy when the kingdom of God descends. When that happens, when the kingdom comes, all that is wrong with the world today will be set right. All that is broken in fallen creation toxic relationships, fractured marriages, debilitating oppression, self-serving politics, warped desires, all that will be transformed, everything changed, brought under the authority and the power and the reign of God. When that happens, God's shalom that the prophets look forward to will be realized. And that Shalom is part and parcel of what the death and the resurrection of Jesus is all about. So the words of Jesus, peace be with you, are pregnant with significance. They denote the dawning of a new order, a change in the makeup of the world. And this fundamental change in reality is wrapped up in the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of the cross, and the resurrection, it is now possible for all of us to experience the peace of God, to experience what it means to come under the authority, the power of God, to have all our lives change and transform because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Christ were not raised, the work of Calvary would not be truly finished. That's why the apostle writes in 1 Corinthians 12 that our faith would have been in vain if Christ be not risen. And that's why we all across the world sing on Easter Sunday morning that famous and triumphant hymn of the church, Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose... He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. That's the glorious cry of the church on Easter morning down through the centuries. And wherever we are, we rejoice in that great truth. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, what is this resurrection peace about? In the time that we have, I want to suggest three things about this peace of the risen Christ. First of all, it is a peace 
bought with a price. Upon greeting his disciples, peace be with you, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. The pronouncement of peace was followed by a display of his wounds. In so doing, Jesus said in effect to them, make no mistake about it, it's really I, your master, standing before you, the same one you saw with his hands and his side pierced on the cross, the crucified one now stands before you. The peace that Jesus offered to his disciples that evening was a peace paid for by his blood, his gruesome death on Calvary. Colossians 1.20 tells us that God reconciled all things to himself and made peace through the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross. The peace won by Christ isn't the plastic peace of utopian speculation. It's not the pretend peace of positive self-talk. Neither is it the vacuous peace of rhetoric alone. It is an active peace, a peace soaked in the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, sacrificed for us. So we are given this peace by a heavy price. See, my friends, we cannot appreciate the peace of Easter Sunday without taking into account the cross of Good Friday. And the cross has unfortunately been overlaid with layers of Christian sentimentality. It has been robbed of its gruesome horrors. We need to, remi to be reminded of the obscenity of the cross. It was a hideous instrument of death. Crucifixion was bloody and messy, and it was deadly. I think there is a tendency sometimes for us to jump too hastily to Easter without lingering to let the horrors of Calvary sink in. The peace that you and I enjoy today was bought with a heavy price. The death of Jesus for the sin of the world began in the heart of the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave. The Father's love sent Jesus to take our place on the cross. Calvary is God's verdict on the human race. It is God saying to all of us that you are worth sending my beloved son to die for. But Calvary is also a verdict on God, our verdict on God. For the cross speaks not only of God's love, but also of our contempt for the truth. It speaks of our rejection of the great gift of God to us. The enemies of Jesus regarded him as a heretic who had infringed the law. They regarded him as one who challenged the authority of the religious establishment. To their mind, Jesus was a threat to the well-being of the people of God, and they felt duty-bound as custodians of the truth to have Jesus killed, to excise, as it were, and to expunge this tumor from the faith of Israel. When they saw with their own eyes Jesus dying on the cross, some of his enemies must have heaved a sigh of relief. Problem solved. Case closed. But unfortunately for them, God would have none of that. By raising Jesus from the dead, God vindicated him before Israel. By raising Jesus from the dead, God overturned the decision of man and proclaimed, in effect, the one you put to death as a heretic is in fact your Messiah, the Savior of the world. The Sanhedrin thought that they were preserving the peace of Israel by Destroying Jesus did not Caiaphas say, it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish? In John chapter 11, verse 50. Yet ironically, it was by means of his death that we have the true and lasting peace of God. Christ, the Prince of Peace, was first the man upon the cross. And by his death, that gap separating us from God because of sin can now be breached. And some of you listening in to this message may in your hearts be wondering if you can find peace, real peace. I want to encourage you to come to Jesus Christ, to consider the cross and what 
he did for us so that we may, through him, experience the peace of God. If Jesus did not die, we would know nothing of the peace of the risen Christ. So as you celebrate Easter and enjoy the blessings that our Lord now bestows on us, let us do so with deep gratitude because of the heavy price that was paid for us. So the peace of the resurrection is one, won for us through a heavy price. Secondly, the resurrection peace comes to us in the midst of fear. The disciples were huddling behind closed doors. We read, for fear of the Jews. They were frightened. The powers that be had already arrested and executed their leader. If they could do that to our leader, what is there to stop them from doing the same to us? The uncertainty was killing them. Not knowing when they might be hauled up next, not knowing what the enemy was up to, kept them on edge. You can't think too far ahead because you never know when the enemies will break down the door and haul us away. Events of the last week of our Lord's earthly life were traumatic to say the least for them. As they made their way to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, Jesus talked openly about how he, and I quote, must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and how he must be killed. Not exactly the kind of motivational speech that you want to hear from your leader. And when Jesus was arrested and crucified, their world came crashing down. Everything they had worked for, all that they had dreamt about, gone. They were no doubt emotionally drained, psychologically out of sync. So the scene in that room that day wasn't one of quiet, restful contemplation. The disciples were edgy, confused, not knowing what's next for them. Should they disperse and go their separate ways? Or do they stay together as a group and somehow continue the good work started by their master? It was in this context of stress mingled with fear of inner convulsion, of disappointment and despair perhaps, that Jesus appeared and pronounced peace upon them. It's like a parent comforting and reassuring his or her frightened child. It's like the parent saying to the child, there's no need to fear. Everything is all right now. I've got everything under control. I paid the price. I've done what had to be done. All the conditions necessary to still the storms of life are fulfilled. All is well. It's a word of assurance at a disturbing time. It's the assurance that the worst that the enemy could do to them would not matter anymore because Christ has conquered the ultimate enemy, death itself. And that's the message we have brothers and sisters, this Easter. Into our fears, into our anxieties, comes the assuring and reassuring words of our Lord. The worst that the enemy could do would not matter anymore because I have conquered death. It's not just physical death that Christ has conquered. It's a spiritual death of being cut off from God. Because of what Christ has done, there is no longer fear of eternal separation from God. We hear the risen Lord saying as it were to us, and you thought the religious and political powers of the world are dangerous? Is this second death, this eternal separation from God that you ought to be concerned about? That if you do not have your sin removed, you are destined for eternal separation from God. But the good news of Good Friday and Easter is that there is a way out of that spiritual separation from God. So Christ has conquered death. There is nothing now that can keep us away from him. There are many things that frighten us. I wonder if someone here, wherever you are, you're so frightened that you have locked yourself up emotionally. 
cutting yourself off from everyone else because you are afraid that you might be hurt again. The pain of the past weighs heavy upon your heart like chains that keep you in a prison of fear. After the blunder the last time round, who is to say that history will not repeat itself? I'm too afraid to try again. I will never open my heart up again to anyone because I was hurt before. I'd rather stay in my locked room of loneliness. The good news this Easter is no locked doors could ever keep the risen Christ from his own. Or perhaps others looking into the unknown future are paralyzed by fear or what tomorrow might bring. What am I going to do now? All my dreams are lost. The one I had hoped to spend the rest of my life with is now taken away from me. What am I going to do? The peace of Christ, the presence and the reality of the risen Lord is here for you. Whatever it is that you are afraid of, And if you are honest, there are many things that do frighten us. Christ comes to us in our fear, and he pronounces his peace. So the good news of Easter is that our Lord is alive, and Lord over time and space. And we can rejoice in that. We do not need to go around with uh, uh, our faces drawn in despair. But we need to know that our Lord is risen. The great reformer Martin Luther once spent three days in a dark depression over something that had been gone, that had some, something that had gone wrong. And he was moping around in the house. And one day, on the third day, his wife came downstairs dressed in mourning clothes. Luther asked her, who, who is dead? God, she replied. Luther rebuked her saying, what do you mean God is dead? God is cannot die. The wife replied, well, the way you've been acting, I was sure he had. Do we live as if God is dead? Do we confront the crisis of our lives as if Christ were not risen? Do we go through this crisis, this pandemic, not knowing that our Lord is on his throne, that there is no panic in heaven, that God is sovereign. The disciples were afraid of death, afraid of what the future might bring. They feared for their lives, afraid that they too might suffer the same fate. The gospel message of Easter is that death no longer has a hold on us. We thank God for that. Even in the midst of death, there is a yearning a yearning for life. I read the story of George Bush Sr. when he was vice president. He represented the United States at the funeral of former Soviet leader uh, Leonid Brezhnev. Bush, Vice President Bush, was deeply moved at the entombment uh, procedure by a silent protest carried out by Brezhnev's widow. She, who loved him, stood motionless by the coffin until seconds before the coffin was closed. Then, just as the soldiers touched the lid of the coffin, Brezhnev's wife performed an act of great courage and hope, a gesture that must surely rank as one of the most profound acts of civil disobedience ever committed. She reached down and made the sign of the cross on her husband's chest. There, in the citadel of secular atheistic power, the wife of the man who had run it all hoped that her husband was wrong. She hoped that there was another life and that that life was best possible or made possible by Jesus who died on the cross. That same Jesus might yet have mercy on her husband. Even in the midst of an atheistic empire that denies the reality of God, that is a craving in the heart of the individual for God. We crave instinctively for for life beyond this life. And that's because God has engraved eternity 
on our hearts. Try as we may, we cannot silence the voice of God within, calling us to himself. The peace that the risen Christ brings is one bought with a heavy price. And it is one that comes to us in the midst of our fears. And thirdly, it is a peace that must be shared in obedience and in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is a peace that must be shared. Now, one of the cardinal principles of biblical interpretation is that the meaning of the text ought to be determined within its context. I suggest that when Jesus said to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so send I you, that we ought to appreciate that notion of send or sending against the light of all that John's Gospel has been saying about the notion of sending. Forty times in John's Gospel, Jesus is described as being sent by the Father. For God, John writes in John chapter 3, verse 17, did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, Jesus was sent on a mission to be the sacrificial Lamb of God, slain for the sins of the world, and now Jesus wants that mission continued through the life and ministry of his disciples. As the Father has sent me, so send are you. What is this sending about? It is premised and rooted in the condition of peace made possible by the risen Christ. If Jesus had not died, if he had not been raised from the dead, then there is no possibility of us going to the world to share the peace of the risen Christ. It is a sending that is prefaced by the empowering gift of the Spirit. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you, Jesus says. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, in verses 21 and 22. The pronouncement of receive the Holy Spirit is a foretaste, an anticipatory sign of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God will descend upon them with power for witness. But here in that room, there is a foretaste of that. The resurrection brings about not only a change in reality outside of us, but it brings about a change inside of us. And that infusing and transforming power of the Spirit is given to all of us. We know that Christ has conquered death. We know there is nothing to be afraid. But we do not have what it takes within us to be confident in the face of anxiety and fears. It is there that the Holy Spirit within us will mediate to us the peace of Christ. That's why Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And that power of his resurrection comes in the gift of the Holy Spirit in the heart of all believers. And we will be sent the way Jesus was sent. As Jesus was sent to the world, we are sent to the world. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. I want you to imagine the scene. Jesus standing before his disciples with his outstretched hands, with the marks of the ordeal of Calvary visible to them. And he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. He's saying in effect, look, look at these wounds. This is the way the Father has sent me. Now in the same way, you will be sent into the world. It is a call not to a life of triumphalism. It is a call to follow the risen Christ to a life of sacrifice, of the giving of ourselves, to follow him, to deny ourselves, to take up the cross so that the peace won for us on Calvary, the peace that was made possible through the resurrection can now, through our lives, under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, be spread through our sacrificial giving, giving of ourselves. And when we do that, we will make a difference as to whether people will receive forgiveness of sins or they will be deprived of their blessing. For we read in verse 23, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now to his dismayed and fearful disciples, Christ entrusted the authority to mediate forgiveness. That same authority is given to us. Of course, we cannot forgive sin. Only God can but we can mediate the gospel of forgiveness to those who need 
that forgiveness. So Easter is also about our mission. Not just about our enjoyment of the blessings of God, but it is a call for us as Easter people to be mediators and conduits of that message to the rest of the world. So to recap, the piece of the resurrection is firstly one procured through a heavy price, namely the death of Jesus on the cross. Remember, the joy of Easter Sunday is possible only because of the pain of Good Friday. It is secondly a peace that comes to us in the midst of fear and confusion and turmoil. It is a peace that comes to us not when everything is rosy, but when everything is difficult, trying and painful. It is not so much the idea of the resurrection. It is the person of the risen Christ that comes to us in our fears. And thirdly, the peace of the resurrection is one that has been sent through us, one that we must embody, we must visualize, and we must verbalize, one that we must proclaim. And we do so in a Christ-like manner by yielding ourselves sacrificially. I began this message by talking about the attempt by followers of some dead leaders to preserve their bodies in glass cases so that the world might see and remember. I also said that as far as Christians are concerned, we have no body of Jesus to display except an empty tomb. Yet in another sense, the body of Christ is in fact on display. Instead of a corpse encased in glass, the body of Christ is the church on display throughout the world, wherever Christians are found. We are the tangible flesh and blood body of Christ in the world. We are the evidence to the world that Jesus indeed is alive from the grave. How would the world know that Jesus Christ is alive today? Let them look at the body of Christ that is the church. Let the world see the way Christians face their fears. Let the world see how we confront challenges. Let the world see how we respond to the pandemic. Let the world bear witness to the Christ-like way, the sacrificial way in which we give of ourselves so that others might live. Through our lives, our values, our words, our deeds, our priorities, our practices, our fortitude, our giving, through all our lives, scattered throughout our land, we demonstrate for all to see that Christ is indeed a life, that we serve a risen Savior. So my brothers and my sisters, let us go forth to demonstrate before our watching world that Jesus Christ is risen from the grave, that Jesus Christ is alive and at work in our world today. And let all God's people say, amen. amen and Amen. Our Father, we pray you would be so gracious to us, be merciful to us, be merciful to the world. Lord, may your reality, your presence be so real in us and through us that the message of the risen Christ may go forth. We pray through the name of the one who has conquered death, even our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the Lord's Supper. Who would have thought when Jesus instituted the, the Lord's Supper almost 2,000 years ago, we would arrive at this time? And it is unprecedented time, and it is my privilege to conduct the communion with you online. I'd like to begin by reading from Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So here is uh, Jesus, the head of the church, and the church here is, is an organic body. And the word used is like an anatomy, the body of Christ. 
and he is the head. And uh, that uh, means he is uh, preeminent, he is uh, superior, and he is ruling, not anyone else, but Jesus alone. He is from the beginning, he founded the church, and he, is a, he established the church, first with the disciples, and now with us. He is first born from the dead. So referring to his death and resurrection, uh, he conquered death, and he was resurrected, and now he's alive. That means we are, in, we are a living church. And as we gather together for communion, we want to remember Christ most of all. So I'd like to invite all of us to stand in your own home, and we will recite the um, Apostle Creed together. Ready? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me, I will never drive out, or drive away. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. I'd like to invite all baptized and confirmed believers uh, are welcome to participate. Uh, kindly refrain from participating if you are unsure of the meaning of the communion. Now, I would like to invite uh, all of you at home to just uh, take the bread and follow after me. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us and to rise again for us. Lord, we are indeed grateful. We thank you for this uh, opportunity to remember the great things you have done for us. And Lord, we worship you. We praise you. We thank you for your sacrifice uh, and for giving us life eternal. Amen. Now you take a cup at home and join me. Jesus said, this is my blood shed for you. Drink it in remembrance of me.
Let us pray together. We thank you, O God, that through word and sacrament you have given us your Son, who is the true bread from heaven and food of eternal life. So strengthen us in your service that our daily living may show our thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne, before the Holy One of Heaven. It's only by your Let us receive the blessing. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, the presence of the Holy Spirit gladden your heart this Easter and bring peace to your soul now and forever. Amen.